This is Musings of the Shibe podcast. I'm your host, Roja Shibe. This is Roja Shibe once again uh, with another episode. This is episode 133, which is a solution for everyday problems. It's about Bitcoin consensus and what exactly it means and why it's a, um, a key component of the Bitcoin protocol, but also a contentious uh, component for a number of people. Um, and we're going to discuss what exactly consensus is and what is the solution it, it solves. Um, in particular, why it is that Bitcoin versus all the other attempts to uh, create a digital currency or asset on the internet prior to that, from uh, hash cash to dig gold to um, Bitcoin, never succeeded, but Bitcoin has. But before we... Um, you know, discuss what Bitcoin consensus is and how it plays its part in the overall discussion of the Bitcoin um, block size debate on the news. So Gina Sand, a co-designer of Pioneer Computer Language, dies at uh, 89. Uh, this is from the New York Times by Steve Lohr. Uh, she passed away June 3rd, I believe. Or no, she died May 20th and it just kind of came out. Uh, Gene A. Salmon, an early software engineer and designer of COBOL, a program language that brought computing to the business mainstream, died on May 20th in Maryland. She was 89. Uh, she lived in a retirement community in Silver Springs and died in a nearby hospital after a brief illness, says Elizabeth Colson, a spokeswoman for the Mount Holick College in Massachusetts, where Ms. Mamet had earned her undergraduate degree and later endowed a professorship in uh, computer science. The programming language Ms. Samet helped uh, bring to life is now more, more than a half a century old, but billions of lines of COBOL code still run on the mainframe computers that underpin the work of corporations and government agencies around the world. Yes, uh, COBOL is a, the learning that language is a dying art, and there's um, been many efforts to try to upgrade it and, and uh, change out of COBOL into our COBOL into a different language set, but it's so entrenched into so much of their underpinnings and infrastructures of so many different types of businesses and government agencies that it is very hard and is a long time kind of bit coming. Um, individuals that had actually retired or passed or even in some cases uh, were laid off or being brought in back into these corporations because um, the younger set of uh, employees or uh, network engineers didn't learn COBOL because they learned the new language and the new thing. And so they don't know how to address a number of the issues and problems that may have occurred as a result of this code. Uh, Smith Samet was a graduate student in mathematics when she first encountered a computer in 1949 at the University of Illinois at Urbane-Champaign. She wasn't impressed. I thought computers are some obscene piece of hardware that I wanted nothing to do with, Ms. Samet recalled in an interview in 2000. Her initial aversion was not unusual among the math purists of the time, long before computer science emerged as an academic discipline. Later, Ms. Samet tried programming calculations onto a chalkboard punch card, which was later then fed into the computer. To my utter astonishment, she said I loved it. In the 19, early 1950s, the com computer industry was in its infancy, with no settled culture or rigid career path. Uh, Lewis Habit, a contemporary of Ms. Samet at IBM, where Ms. Samet worked for nearly three decades, observed they took anyone who seemed to have an aptitude for problem-solving skills, bridge players, chess players, even women. Ms. Samet became one of the most prominent women of her generation in computing. Her deep interest was in program language, languages and using them to open computing to a wider audience. Her ambition, Ben Sherman, a computer scientist at the University of Maryland, recalled his saying was to put every person in communication with the computer. Uh, she was born March 23, 1928, in New York City. Both her parents, Harry and Ruth Samet, were lawyers. Uh, Jean excelled in math and started in the first grade and chose to attend college at Mount Holick because it had an excellent mathematics department. Uh, her program career included stints at uh, Spear Gyroscope and its successor, Spear Rand, and Sylvia and Electronics before she joined IBM in 1961. So she really was right there at the, the heart of the beginning of just pretty much um, everything when it comes to computers. You know, Rand, Sylvia and Electronics was just it's still kind of around. I mean, just check out any VCR, DVD, or TVD, or TV, or DV TVD combo. They still have those out there. Uh, Sylvian, you probably had a Sylvian TV or VCR or DVD uh, system at one point in time. Uh, she also is a historian advocate for her profession. Her book, Programming Languages and History and Fundamentals, published in 1969, was and remains a classic in the field. 
said uh, Dag Spicer, a senior um, curator of the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. In 1974, Ms. Samet became the first female president of the Association for Computer Machinery, a leading professional association in computer science. She held the post for two years. Yet her most enduring legacy is the role she played in the creation and longevity of COBOL. By the end of the 1950s, it became clear that computers could be a powerful tool not only for scientific calculations, but also in business, helping to manage accounting, payroll, purchasing, and manufacturing operations. That led to the creation of the Common Business Oriented Language, or COBOL, a means to handle not just numbers, but also business data. The United States Department of Defense, the largest purchaser of the computers at the time, set general guidelines for COBOL, including asking for the maximum use of simple English to broaden the base of those who can state problems with the computer. Later, the Pentagon Clary would not buy or release computers unless they ran COBOL. Uh, Grace Hopper, a computer pioneer at Spear Rand in the late 1950s, led the effort to bring computer makers together to collaborate on a new programming language. Ms. Hopper often called the mother of the COBOL, but she was not one of six people, including Ms. Samet, who designed the language. In fact, Ms. Samet rarely failed to point out that Ms. Samet worked for a civilian electric at the time. I yield to no one in my admiration for Grace, she said, but she was not the mother, creator, or developer of COBOL. Uh, Ms. Samet and the other five programmers did much of the new languages designed during two weeks of a nearly round-the-clock work, holed up in the Sherry Netherland Hotel in Manhattan. Their proposal was presented in November 1959 and accepted with few changes by the computer makers that worked for the Pentagon. That right there, um, personally, I think that paragraph right there is the makings of a, of a movie, honestly, or a, a, a very in-depth documentary about these programmers coming together from different aspects of the industry, from different corporations working together to create this program that um, is still utilized today and is very much the underpinnings for pretty much launching the entire computer age, if you will. Uh, COBOL, particularly the early versions, allowed programmers the freedom to write code without much structure, leading to complex, sprawling programs scorned as so-called spaghetti code. Academics were often dismissive. In 1975, Esker Dushesh, a prominent computer scientist, wrote that the use of COBOL cripples the mind. But COBOL is invented for its time and the techniques it used to describe or represent data and computer code. It provided software to organize basic data on cus customers or citizens, including names and addresses, social security numbers, and phone numbers. Uh, Brian Kingan, a computer scientist at Princeton University, said COBOL was a very good at handling formatted data. As it evolved, Ms. Samer pushed to inject more engineering discipline into the language to make it more useful and reliable in industries like banking, healthcare, retailing, and for government agencies. Uh, Gary Botch, a scientist for a software engineer at IBM Research, said that Gene Samet was a strong, consistent voice of interrogate, interrogate in, the, in those efforts. She leaves no immediate survivors. Uh, COBO was initially intended as a short-term solution to be the problem handling business data. The technology that might be useful for a year or two until something better came along. <laughs> oh God, isn't that always the case with um, just anything really? But it's lived on. More than 200 billion lines of COBOL code are now in use and an estimated 2 billion lines are added or changed each year according to IBM research. So a passing of a legend, if you will. Business in the Age of Ethereum. Uh, this was from TechCrunch, uh, posted by Deep Patel. When Bitcoin burst on the scene in 2009, it challenged a pre preconceived notion about the limitations of transactions. Fast forward eight years and another platform is dominating the headlines. Ethereum has built on Bitcoin's potential and is driving the revolution in financial transactions. Ethereum is an open source platform that facilitates the development of a next generation decentralized platforms. It was conceptualized in 2013 by uh, Vital Paterum, who at the time was conducting research within the Bitcoin community. Since Paterum's initial um, ideation, Ethereum has grown in interest and scale, and today it poses to overhaul open source development. Bitcoin opened the world to the possibility of a shared ledger, and now Ethereum is expanding on that potential. And according to Paterum, Ethereum uses many of the same systems, such as blockchains and peer-to-peer -peer networking, in order to generate a shared world computing platform that can flexibly but securely run an application users want to code, shared ledgers like the Bitcoin included. Since Bitcoin's debut on the world stage, many developers have sought to apply the ideology to new systems similar to underpinnings by blockchain technology. However, these iterations failed to impact the tech and financial service communities because they were limited in to a few functionalities. The intent of Ethereum is to just transcend these um, limitations by creating a blockchain protocol with its own native programming language which enable an application to be written on top. The structure supports all existing and future applications and lends itself 
to an environment of constant and immediate development and innovation. Although Bitcoin birthed Ethereum in the past year, Ethereum has eclipsed its predecessor in terms of future promise. In March 2017, Ethereum's digital currency in Ether reached an all-time high of $30. I believe it is much higher than that. I think it's close. I'll check as soon as I finish the article where it's at right now. Uh, boosting the market cap of Ethereum to $2.57 billion. Another facet that sets Ethereum apart from Bitcoin is the support that Ethereum continues to receive from the financial and technology communities. Companies have recognized the immense power of blockchain technology and cryptocurrency to, be, to boost security and efficiency, and they're joining the party. Institutions like Microsoft and JP Morgan have pledged their support to the development of Ethereum through the formation of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. The purpose of the alliance is to ensure potential of Ethereum and realizing realized across industries. Companies involved in, in the alliance are working towards creating a standard open source version of Ethereum, which will serve as a blueprint for all um, adaptations. JP Morgan is already working on the implementation of its own Ethereum-based system to facilitate seamless transfers of funds between global JP Morgan branches. Also, um, we're going to talk about it on a different episode um, built on the potential of what Ethereum is doing after we finish the uh, Bitcoin block size debate discussion, but um, a country has um, tokenized their currency through Ethereum, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Although many organizations are invested in leveraging Ethereum to serve as the basis for uh, privatized versions, the overreaching goal is that one day each institution's private networks will be connected to the global Ethereum blockchain. This will establish a new universal benchmark for information transactions. Although Ethereum has enormous potential to create more secure and streamlined global transaction systems, to concentrate on what is yet to come is overlook the changes Ethereum has already enacted. Early in Ethereum, adopters were driving innovation through decentralization. Here are some of the ways today's cutting-edge businesses are applying Ethereum to solve existing problems and create future solutions. Uh, increased protective measures and online consumer data. Identity theft is a constant concern across today's global landscapes. Organizations and individuals are increasingly aware of impeding threat to digital security. One company, KYC Chain, is tapping into Ethereum to help businesses safely onboard new customers, blending simple identification process and know your customer regulations. KYC Chain solution empowers customers to manage their own identity by sharing only necessary information. Uh, KYC Chain protects users' data on the platform through a series of cryptographic protocols. Uh, the platform allocates responsibility to trusted gatekeepers who have been given clearance to retrieve and authenticate customer documents. Uh, enhancing crowdfunding capabilities and transparencies. Business development has changed drastically over the past decade. No longer a business in an entrepreneur is regulated raising funds through VC and private investor rate relations. Today, hopeful entrepreneurs are finding, finding um, public support through crowdfunding. Platforms like Kickstarter and GoFundMe have open conversations and opportunities around business development. I would also add um, Patreon and similar uh, platforms like Patreon to that as well, where you're just giving directly to primarily um, media-driven companies, but the, there's products out there that could be are supported by Patreon. But it's heavily like YouTubers, podcasters, bloggers, um, book authors, uh, things of that nature, content creators are using that, ty that type of platform. Organizers like WeFund are looking to expand on public's growing affinity for crowdfunding through blockchain implementation. WeFund's platform utilizes Ethereum smart contract capabilities to offer customized solutions to contributors. Standard crowdfunding platforms generally issue basic refunds and if project goals are not met. Thanks to Ethereum smart contracts, project organizers can establish customized agreements or hooks, as WeFund calls them. Smart contracts expand the way in which individuals can contribute to development while ensuring complete transparency and strict adherence to contract boundaries. Smart contracts are a way of transporting anything of value, money, shares, or data without an intermediary, and Ethereum technology makes it po this possible. It used to be that you have to have to have to make a request to receive something of value and wait for an intermediary to re facilitate the request. Smart contracts are immediate. Another benefit of smart contracts is the rules and regulations associated with contracts are automatically enforced. Making a decentralized global workforce a reality. Ethereum and Ethereum supporters believe in a complete decentralization. They envision a system that puts users in complete control and allows them to innovate in any direction. Ethereum can also help budding entrepreneurs build the right teams. An Ethereum-run organization is based on democratic shareholder voting, which means every backer or contractor has access to your latest updates and initiatives based on the contracts you've drawn up. Ethereum takes the pain out of managing an organization and answering to shareholders because of those uh, 
incentives are automatically executed within the contract. Colony is one platform leveraging Ethereum to drive decentralized global work organizations. Colony strips away organizational hierarchy and supplies the management or distributed workforce based on the principles of meritocracy. Colony encourages people to invest their time, unique expertise, feedback, and ideas in global projects. The system run on Ethereum assesses users and the value they contribute to colonies on the platform. Users are awarded tokens based on the completed task and weighted value. Automatic cryptocurrency platforms payments are facilitated through Stripe to ensure that all contributors are adequately compensated based on value. Colony, Colony envisions a, demo, um, a democratized working future, one in which inviv- individuals are not limited by their location. Though still in beta, Colony is hopeful that its collaborative network will drive the future of workforce management. And then finally, financial development. One of the theorems often cited cited benefits of the reduction of operational fees. Ethereum eliminates intermediaries, thus decreasing transactional fees and increasing the speed and efficiency of transactions. Each industry standards to benefit from improvements in efficiency and reduction in costs, but this innovation is especially exciting for organizations in developing economies. Many people in developing economies are subject to complicated remittance processes, exorbitant online payment fees, and high currency exchanges. EverX, a fintech company, is leveraging Ethereum to help people in developing nations with limited access to banks and global financial systems. EverX crypto cash solution enables simple cross-border transactions. EverX comprehensive solution not only enables people around the world to employ more agency in managing personal finances, it also provides them with more global investment opportunities. The acquisition of Ethereum is nowhere near complete. However, the technology has already managed to set in motion decentralized solutions that were once deemed impossible. Recently, it's been lauded as the future of cryptocurrency, but Ethereum's potential outstrips even those accolades. The amount of support for the development of Ethereum and rapid adoption among emerging organizations are changing how we think about digital safety, crowdfunding, workforce management, and economic development. There you, there you go. A good update and breakdown of Ethereum. And let me check on that price. Yeah, Ethereum is changing. And is trading at three hundred seventy nine dollars as as of recording of this episode. This is from Bitcoin dot com. Court rules that banks can legally deny services to Bitcoin businesses in Israel, by Kevin Helms. A recent trial in Tel Aviv District Court ruled in favor of a large bank which dropped the Bitcoin exchange as a client, despite the exchange following all the proper anti laundering, uh, laundering AML and know your customer KYC requirements. Court ruled in favor of Bank Lumu. Uh, the Tel Aviv District reportedly ruled last week against Israel's bank exchange Bit of Golds in favor of Bank Lumu, the country's second largest bank by total assets. The case was brought to court by the Tel Aviv Base Exchange after it was denied service by the bank. The proceedings followed an incident in which the bank claimed hackers broke into the accounts in order to send funds from the bank to buy from the bank to buy bitcoins. In it told the court, Bits, Bit of Golds assisted the bank with investigation, but there was no indication that it involved in any way. The court learned. Nonetheless, Bank Lumu told the court that its own cybersecurity issues warranted a cause to stop offering banking service to the exchange. Fear of cryptocurrencies. AML KYC is not enough. It is shown in court that Bits of Gold had followed all of AML and KYC procedures, which include reporting all transactions larger than a certain amount to the authorities as required by Israeli law. However, Bank Lumu still claimed that the nature of the cryptocurrency renders its AML requirements inadequate since it cannot know when the end receiver of the cryptocurrency is. The bank told the court that it fears how criminal criminal organizations can send their monkeys to buy bitcoins and transfer them to wallets under their control. Monkeys are low-level people under their control who will never testify against the masterminds. Finance Matic disclaimed. The publication relayed the bank's concerns. A cryptocurrency wallets are not issued by any authority and are only identified by a bunch of numbers. It cannot make sure that it is following its own AML requirements as bitcoins can be exchanged back into fiat at the same unre- unregulated value, regulated venue outside of Israel. While praising bits of gold for its transparency and compliance operations, the court ruled that the Bank of the Moon can decide to deny service to it. About bits of gold and Bitcoin in Israel. Bits of gold have been providing Bitcoin exchanges services since 2013. Users can buy Bitcoin using bank transfers, credit cards, or cash. At press time, bank transfers are still an option and enlisted on the company's website. Uh, cash purchases are made through the GMT transfer network, and they take about three minutes to complete. Uh, GMT operates through a vast number of banks and money transfer transfer operations worldwide. Customers can an open an order on the Bits of Gold website, then go to the open the location to deposit money. 
Alternatively, they can use a Bitcoin ATM located at the Bitcoin Embassy in Tel Aviv. Bits of Ghost CEO uh, Yuval Rush explained in the, to the to the marker local publication. He said that his company has gone through great lengths to give their full cooperation to regulators. For example, customers with transactions larger than 50,000 shekels worth about 14,000 in USD are required by regulators to visit the company's office and fill out paperwork for the money laundering pro prohibition authority in person. This is a bit unusual in the Bitcoin market, but we tried to cooperate with regulators and integrate into the world of finance, he detailed, adding. Uh, regulation is one of the things that have been important to us since the beginning. From the very beginning, we saw the problem with Bitcoin in terms of its, annoyance char its anonymous characteristics, and we wanted to receive a currency service certificate, and we received it in August in 2013. There's that. And finally, crypto mining blog. Uh, the creator of Litecoin leaving Coinbase to focus on LTC. Uh, today is my last day at Coinbase. I'll miss working with y'all. I'm going to shift my focus in Litecoin now and to the moon. Uh, the creator of the coin, Charlie, has tweeted that he's leaving Coinbase and will go, be going to order the focus of the creation. Good news for one of the oldest altcoins and, and a total change for the no need of further development attitude for the last couple of years. In the last couple of months, we've seen significant changes to, in LTC. Uh, they did, act, after all, activate SegWit, and they're pretty soon going to probably add on Lightning Network. And that's led to the revival of the altcoin after a long period of sleep. And news that Charlie is focusing his attention on Litecoin is also a very positive one. We're already seeing the market respond to the positive news with the price of light LTC rising. And this came out June 11th. So that is it for the news. On to the heart of the matter, Bitcoin consensus. So to understand um, Bitcoin consensus, you're going to have to understand a couple components. One is the proof of work system, and the other is the Byzantine general problem, which I have a link in the, P uh, the PDF of the original paper here in the show notes. So what is the Byzantine General problem? So the Byzantine General's problem is an agreement protocol that is built around an imaginary general who makes a decision to attack or retreat and must communicate his decision to his lieutenant. Uh, the Byzantine General's problem is one of the many in the field of agreement protocol. Um, in 1982, Leslie Lamport described the problem in a paper written with Marshall Pierce and Robert Schustack. Lampard framed the paper around the story problem after observing what he felt was an inordinate amount of attention received by uh, Judge Uska's Dan philosopher's problem, dining philosopher's problem. The problem was built around an imaginary general who makes a decision to attack or retreat and must communicate the decision to his lieutenant. A given number of these actors are traitors, possibly including the general. Traitors cannot be relied upon to properly communicate orders, or worse yet, they may actively alter messages and attempt to subvert the process. So think of double spending, spam attacks, DOS attacks, malicious nodes, um, miners deliberately doing empty blocks or orphan blocks or uh, false blocks, if you will, uh, any kind of malicious type of activity. What is the solution that um, Satoshi Nakamoto came up with and he utilized it from a different system was called proof of work to combat this. So. The generals are collectively known as processes. The general who initiates the order is the source process, and order sent to the other processes are messages. Traders, generals, and lieutenants are faulty processes, and low generals and lieutenants are correct processes. The order retreat attack is a message with a one or a zero. In general, the solution to the agreement problem must pass three tests, termination, agreement, and, vid and v validity. As applied to the Byzantine general's problem, these tests are one, a solution has to guarantee that all the correct processes eventually reach your destination regarding the value or the order they have been given. So when you are um, processing a transaction on the, the network, you have the miners who put the transaction into the block. The block is then pushed out into the network, which is picked up by the nodes and added to the public ledger. Um, this prevents, you know, double spinning. So the actual transaction itself, having been sent, it's Acknowledge is accepted and processed through. Uh, you're not going to have someone saying, you know, that's not a real process, it's not a real action, um, trying to double spin or do anything like that of that nature. Um, there's checks and balances and put in place because once it's once it's been processed into a block and once it's hit, once it's been in, into that block, you can't double spin again because it's it's done. You can't you can't do it. You can't even undo it really. Um, 
So you have that. So that, that's a preventative measure of a double spinning and preventing malicious actor. All correct, correct process have to decide on the same value of the order they've been giving. So it has to go, you know, it has to go through the main pool, and then it goes into the to, into the block by the miners. The miners get their reward. Uh, it's processed out, kicked out into the network, which is picked up by the nodes, and the nodes add it to the public ledger, and now it's added to the continuous um, open ledger that is uh, the Bitcoin block chain. Uh, if the process, if the source process is the correct process, all processes have to decide on the value that was originally given by the same, by the source process. So if I send it from my wallet um, to another wallet you know, for a transaction, all the different steps have to take place for everything to be considered valued, to be considered valid. One side effect is this, if the source process is faulty, all other processes still have to agree on the same value. It doesn't matter what the value they agree on, they simply have to agree. So if the general is subversive, all the tenants still have to have, have to come to a common unanimous decision. So if I were to set a, a double spend, if you will, to try to double spend and send the same, somehow figure out a way to send the same Bitcoin out again, the miners and the nodes would have to recognize that as a faulty send, if you will, and agreed upon the fact in a unanimous manner that that is a false value, uh, just as they do with a correct value. If I sent a correct amount of coins out uh, and through the process from one transaction to another, from one peer to another peer, then they also have to kind of agree. And you have to do these, these steps because all they have to do is check the ledger, check the previous history to know if the value of that particular source is correct. And they do this with every single type of transaction that goes onto the network. And this is how you prevent double spending. This is what proof of work does. So let's talk a little bit about proof of work again. Uh, proof of work or protocol or function is an economic measure to deter denial service attacks and other service abuses such as spam on the network would require some work for service request service requesters usually meaning processing time from the computer. So mining, you have to function mining and do the algorithm to uh, put out, put those transactions out onto the network, into the blockchain, out into the network, and to be validated. This prevents people from just, you know, just like email or any any kind of just creating and copying and pasting, copying and pasting, copying and pasting, and doing double spending and um, diminishing and devaluing the, the existence of um, any type of cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. Uh, the concept was first presented by uh, Cynthia Dork and Monique Nero in 1993 journal article, The True of Proof of Work, or POW, was first coined and formalized in a 1998 paper by Marcus Jacobson and Ari Jules. The early example of proof of work systems used to give value to the currencies utilized by shell money, uh, the Somalian islands, and elsewhere. A key feature of these schemes is they're asymmetric. The work must be moderately hard but feasible on the requester side, but easy to check for the service provider. The idea is known as a CPU cost function, or client puzzle. Uh, so doing the cryptographic in SHA-256 is easy for a computer to validate and also process. Uh, conceptualized puzzles are a CPU pricing function. It's, dis it's distinctive from a capuchu, which are so annoying, which is intended for a human to solve quickly rather than a computer. Uh, proof of space. Proposals apply the same principle by providing a dedicated amount of memory or disk space instead of CPU time. And proof of bandwidth approaches have been discussed in context of cryptocurrency. Proof of ownership aims at providing specific data held by the provider. So there's other different forms of proof, but currently at this time, proof of work is the system or protocol that Bitcoin currently utilizes. So kind of continuing on this discussion here, um, all this has come from the Wicca. One popular system is Bitcoin mining in Hashcash, which uses partial hash inversions to prove the work was done as a goodwill token to send an email. For example, for instance, the following header represents uh, 2 to the 52 power hash computation to send to a messenger uh, of Calvin at comics.net on January 19, 2038. It is verified with a single computation by the SHA first hash or stamping, including the colon and any amount of white space following it, beginning with 52 binary nodes. So you'd have to do this mathematical computation to prove that this was this action was done. Whether proof of systems can actually solve a particular denial service issue such as spam problem is subject to debate. The system might make spinning spam emails obtrusive, unproductive to the spammer, but should also not prevent legitimate users from sending their message. Uh, proof of work systems are using a primitive but other 
more complex cryptographic systems such as Bitcoin, which is a system similar to Hashcash. So this is for email as a means to stop spam email as they're describing here. But with Bitcoin, you know, you have fees to send fees in order to um, mitigate I guess spam, and we kind of talked to what spam is and what people consider spam to be, but you know, malicious activity on the network to clog it up or provide provide channel uh, challenges uh, towards the network, if you will. Uh, there's two proof. There's two classes of proof of work protocols: challenge response protocols assume a direct interla interactive link between the requester, client, and provide server. The writer chooses a challenge, say an item that is set with a property. The requester finds relevant response and set which is sent back and checked by the provider. As the challenge is chosen on the spot by the provider, it's difficult and can be adapted to its current load. The work on the requester side may be bound if the challenge response protocol has a known solution chosen by the provider or is known to exist with a bound service space. A solution verification protocols don't assume such a link. As a result, the problem must be self-imposed before a solution is sought by the requester and the provider. We must check the problem and choose a the found solution. Most such schemes are unbound probabilistic interactive procedures such as Hashcast. So doing a mathematical problem such as a SHA-256 uh, is something that uh, Bitcoin does. You have to solve that problem before anything really gets going. And then down here, reusable, reusable proof of work as e-money. Computer scientist Hal Finney built on the proof of work idea, yielding a system that exploited the reusable proof of work. The idea of making proof of work reusable for some practical purposes had already been established. In 1999, Finney's response for RPO was a token money. Just as gold's coin value is thought to be underpined by the value of the raw gold needed to make it, the value of RPO tokens is guaranteed by the value of real-world resources required to mint a POW token. In Hal Finney's version of RPO, the PO token is a piece of hash cash. Because you're doing the mathematical computation, this part, all this work, you're going to be rewarded with a token, a monetary system that can be so dropping down here. Um, until 2009, 2009 uh, Finney's system was only RPO system to be implemented. It never saw uh, economic significant use. In 2009, the Bitcoin network went online. Bitcoin is a proof-of-work cryptocurrency that, like Finney's RPO, is based on hash cash POW. But in Bitcoin, double spending protection is provided by the centralized BTP protocol for tracking transfers of coins, rather than the hardware trusted computer functions used by RPO. Bitcoin has a better trustworthiness because it's protected by computation. Um, RPO is protected by private keys and stored in the TPM hardware and manufacturers holding TPM private keys. Hackers who steal a TPM manufacturer key or anyone capable of obtaining the key by examining the TP chip itself can subvert the assurance. Bitcoins are mined using the hash proof proof of function by individual nodes and verified by the decentralized P2P Bitcoin network. And going on, useful proof of work. Um, Many POW systems require the clients to be useless work, such as inventing a hash function. That means that a lot of resources, mainly electricity, the power of the client's computer, is wasted in vain. To mitigate the loss, some alternative coins use POW systems where they perform work that's actually useful. For example, prime coin requires clients to find an unknown prime number of certain types, which can be useful for site applications. Because a lot of resources, is, um, electricity is utilized to do the computation and do the proof of work. Um, some people see this as a waste of function because it's, all you're doing is getting a token out of it. All that power can also be utilized for something else, if you will, or something more substantial. So because of this mechanism of proof of work, finding of the mathematical problem that allows you to put the trans transactions into the Bitcoin block, block um, and get rewarded with, right now it's um, 12 Bitcoins, this secures the network. This allows for um, double spending not to occur. Um, it also helps solve the Byzantine problem when it comes to that issue because there is a protocol set about how each function is supposed to go. And if it doesn't happen, then you can't spend your Bitcoin and you can't double spend the Bitcoin. And the network is not because it's decentralized, because it's spread out. You don't necessarily have to trust everybody, but if you don't go through these one, two, three, four, five steps, then it's not considered valid, if you will. And all these things are what helps build what is, you know, the Satoshi Nakamoto's consensus, where you need to get everyone to agree to the set of rules prior to doing anything. Here we go. Proof of, not proof, but Bitcoin consensus. 
So a list of consensus, this comes from BitcoinStackExchange.com. Is there a comprehensive list of Bitcoin core consensus rules anywhere? And the Bitcoin Wiki full node article states here are examples of consensus rules, so there are many more. Blocks may only create a certain number of Bitcoins, currently 12.5 uh, Bitcoin per block. Transactions may have correct signatures for the Bitcoins being spent, and transaction blocks may be in the correct data format within a single blockchain, and transaction output cannot be double spent. So these are the base, basic core rules. And here's an answer. In the current consensus rules defined in the code of the Bitcoin client, which is used today by majority, this is by definition a term of consensus. Tomorrow we, tomorrow we can have another consensus rule. So if Bitcoin XT had changed, then we would have a different consensus. If Bitcoin Classic comes in, because these are both hard forks, then we have a different consensus. So here we go for the for the protocol rule. This is from Bitcoin Wicca. Uh, the Wicca substantially documents the Bitcoin protocol, but equally important are the rules used by the client to process messages. It's crucial that the clients follow certain rules in order to maintain consistency across the network and protect the Bitcoin security guarantee. Here, the focus is handling t um, transactions and block messages because this is a tricky logic. This will skip over the method of request and forwarding the message for now and describe what to do when they are received. Also, this will describe the minimal data structures in rather abstract terms, ignoring the client various index maps and hash tables used in efficiency. Uh, the map to structure are transactions and blocks. Blocks are composed by the block header followed by the transaction and the block. Transactions are identified by their hash, blocks by the hash of their header. Blocks have previous uh, pointers and link them into the graph. Conceptually, the clients have the following data structures. So transaction, transaction pool, orphan transaction. Blocks. There are three categories of blocks. Blocks in the main branch, the transactions the blocks are considered least tentatively confirmed. Blocks on the side branch or off the main branch, these are blocks have at least tentatively lost the race to be in the main branch and orphan blocks. These are blocks which don't link into the main branch only because of the missing preceder or ninth level predecessor. Blocks in the first two categories from a tree root of the genesis block linked by the previous pointer, which means towards the root. The main branch is defined as a branch. So basically, here we go. So you have to put the transactions in a certain manner into the blocks. This is a set in the protocol. If it doesn't happen, you're going to get orphans. So if something happens where the uh, transaction um, header doesn't happen, it's going to be orphans. Um, blocks in the main branch, blocks on the side branch. You might sometimes happen, happen where um, two blocks are solved at the same time, but whichever one gets pushed out into the public ledger first is the one that wins. So you have like this little side uh, branch of the main branch that can happen, but it, it never continues on because um, it's not considered valid. It doesn't have a you know continuing propagation of other blocks behind it, you know, continuing on forward. So it's just it's just out there. And this also kind of sometimes happens with orphan blocks as well. So you have to have a certain order in order to get into the blocks, and the blocks are done in a certain fashion. So there's so this is part of the protocol. Uh, difficulty change. Uh, the difficulty changes. This is uh, finding of the blocks. Uh, the choice is designed to occur every two weeks. Once 2016 blocks have been reached, we loop back until we hit the 2016 block before the current one. We find the difference in time between the current block and that one. The difference is called the actual time span. is limited to balance between two, we two weeks to four to two weeks times four. This will get the last target for the old two-week windows and multiply it by the ratio of the actual time span. So every two weeks, the difficulty of finding the blocks changes. It gets harder. If the old set of blocks is completed too fast and the target is loaded, uh, it sure ensures it takes longer to solve these new blocks and vice versa. So if hashing power drops down or if someone finds a new means of finding the uh, blocks, then you raise the difficulty. If stuff takes a little bit longer because hashing power drops or whatever, for whatever reason, then the target is lowered. Block creation fees. This is another part of the aspect of the protocol and a contentious one. Uh, block creation fees change every uh, 200,010 blocks. The block creation fee is a function of the block height on the game, and it's calculated using the 64 integer. So this is with the halving. So the fee structure is it started with 50 BTC and fall into 25 BCC and 12.5 BCC. In the next halving, there will be 
six until eventually all 21 million bitcoins are found. So for example, if someone wanted to double the amount of bitcoin in existence from 21 million to 42 million, that would be changing the consensus because it was agreed upon for essence from the very beginning, from the genesis of the, the blockchain, that there will only be 21 million Bitcoin coming into existence. Same thing with the halving. If they wanted to change um, the halving to where instead of 12.5 BTC drops down to uh, in a quarter, then they can do it to where you lose maybe two and a half uh, Bitcoin in the next Instead of being a halving, you, you, there's less Bitcoin, so the reward block would be 10 Bitcoins instead of, um, and so on for, so forth. So that type of change would be a change in consistency. It would require a hard fork because it's an actual change of the protocol, the series rules. It's not a cosmetic thing where you're trying to do a soft fork, where you're trying to um, secure uh, or allow for Bitcoins to have multi-signatures with their private keys. So you have um, the keys broken up into one, two, three, four, you know, up to six parts for wallets. That's that's a soft change. That's not a really a, a, a protocol change. That's just changing the breaking up of a private key so that uh, when you send Bitcoin to a public address, um, you know it's secure that you need, you know, three or four or maybe all five signatures for that Bitcoin to be released. And then you have text messages. The messages hold a single, single transaction. So just the nature of uh, how transactions are sent out or sent in done a different simple way. Block messages. The messages hold a single block. How blocks are distributed are done in a um, from the miners to the nodes to the wallets. All that being read has to be done in a specified manner. So <clears throat> this comes from Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, it's by Aaron Van Weerden. Why some changes to the Bitcoin required consensus. Bitcoin's four layers. The long-lasting block size dispute and the recent introduction of several new Bitcoin implementations highlight that not all Bitcoin nodes apply the exact same rule, and perhaps more important, not all development uh, teams apply similar policies when it comes to implementing these rules. The development team behind Bitcoin Core, or Bitcoin's historic reference client, requires widespread community consensus before it implements rule changes such as raising the block size limit, while other changes are not held to the same standard. Meanwhile, some Bitcoin forks such as Bitcoin LRJ are generally accepted by the development community, while others such as Bitcoin Classic attract a lot of controversy. This is considered inconsistent by some. And what is Bitcoin L? Bitcoin not. Oh, this is, um, we'll talk about that when we talk about lowering and keeping the block size. So why some changes to the Bitcoin require consensus? Bitcoin's four layer by Bitcoin Magazine, written by Aaron Van Weerden. The long-lasting block size dispute and the recent introduction of several new Bitcoin implications highlight that not all Bitcoins apply the exact same rule. And perhaps more important that not all development teams apply similar policies when it comes to implementing these rules. The development team behind Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin's historic reference client, requires widespread community consensus before implementing rules changes such as raising the block size limit, while other changes are not held to the same standard. Meanwhile, some Bitcoin forks such as the Bitcoin LRJ, which we will talk about um, in the next episode, um, which has to do about lowering the block size, are generally accepted by the development community, while others such as Bitcoin Classic attract a lot of controversy. This is considered inconsistent, inconsistent by some. But the difference can be explained. Certain rule changes implemented in certain forks impact the Bitcoin network very differently than others. Or more specifically, certain rule changes impact very different layers of the Bitcoin network. And some of these rule changes can split the Bitcoin network while others cannot. To clarify these differences, Bitcoin Core developer and Surfix CEO Eric Lomb Lombards recently proposed to, to tag the relevant layers in all Bitcoin improvement proposals. These are the four main layers of Bitcoin network as specified in his BIP 123 and the respective importance of consensus on each. So let's read um, what BIP 123 is. So BIP 123, BIP, BIP clarification. Here's the abstract. The document describes the clarification scheme for BIP. BIPs are classified by system layers, but lower numbered layers involve more intricate interoperability requirements. Specific defines the layers and sets the specific criteria for deciding which layers 
a particular standard bits along. So like bit 9 is lower on the scale than, uh, say, bit 148. Motivation. Bitcoin is a system involving a number of different standards. Some GAN standards are absolute requirements for interoperability, while others can be considered optional, giving um, implementers a choice of whether to support them. In order to have a bit process which most, more closely reflects the interoperability requirements for the ability for the network to work, it's necessary to categorize bit accordingly. Lower layers percent considerably greater challenges in getting standards accepted and deployed. The specification. Standard bits are placed in one of four layers. One consensus, two peer services, three API RPCs, and four applications. Non-standard bits may be placed in these layers or none at all. <coughs> consensus layers. Consensus layer defined cryptographic commitment structures. Its purpose is to ensure that anyone can locally evaluate whether a particular state or history is valid, pro providing settlement guarantees ensuring eventual governance. The consensus layer is not concerned with how messages are propagated on the network, so how transactions go back and forth. Disagreements over the consensus layer can result in network partitioning or forks, where different nodes might end up accepting different incompatible histories. We further subdivide consensus layer changes into soft forks and hard forks. Soft forks. In soft fork structure, uh, they were valid under the old rules are no longer valid under the new rules. The structures that were invalid under the old rules continue to be invalid under the new rules. Hard forks. In hard fork structures that were invalid under the old rules become valid under the new rules. So, for example, uh, soft forks, if you were to, um, so for soft forks, if you were to raise the block size, you, could, you can do that in a soft fork, uh, which is one of the solutions, and we'll talk about that when we talk about SegWit, where you, um, the old block size was one megabyte, so that's no longer valid because you raised it to two megabytes. A uh, hard fork is, um, again, this is the way there's some is considering um, hard fork, uh, you can do the same thing. So there's two different methods of doing it. But with a hard fork, it's, it's, this is where you get the split of the chain, really, um, with hard forks versus soft forks. And we'll get a little bit into the nuance of that, even though we describe the term uh, when we get into SegWit. But a better example for the hard fork is, for example, um, what was not considered valid was uh, having 42 million uh, big bitcoins, and you do a hard fork to raise the amount of bitcoins created to uh, 42. Uh, peer service layers. Peer service layers specify how nodes find each other and propagate messages. Only a subset of all specified peer services are required for a basic node inter interoperability. Nodes can support further optional extensions. It's always possible to add new services without breaking compatibility with existing services then gradually depreciate older services. In this manner, the entire network can be, can be upgraded without serious risk, risk of service disruption. So for example, um, wallets, uh, the multi-signature portion, or um, how nodes themselves uh, speak to one another. API and RPC layers. API and RPC layers specify high-level calls accessible to applications. Support for these bits is not required for basic network interoperability, but might be expected for some client applications. Again, it has to deal with um, wallets and stuff, and even nodes to some extent. There's room at this layer to allow for competing standards about breaking basic network interoperability and application layers. The application layers specify high-level structure abstracts and conventions allow different applications to support similar features and shared data. Classification for existing bits. So, <clears throat> and it goes through the bits, um, pretty much all of them here, so. BIP1, BIP2, and BIP9 uh, don't have a layer designation. Um, BIP10 is an application because it has multi-sig transaction distribution. BIP11, application. Uh, BIP12 is consensus. Uh, it's a soft fork. You're changing something through soft fork. 13 is application. 14 pure services. 15 application. 16 consensus soft fork. 17 is and 18 are soft fork as well because there's consensus. 19 through 21 is application, um, 22 through 23 is API, uh, has to deal with pool mining and fundamentals, uh, duplication transactions to fix a, an issue, uh, consensus it was a soft fork, 31 is peer services, uh, Pong messaging, messaging um, across the network, 32 is application, those are the hierarchical uh, deterministic wallets, the HD wallets. 
um, allowing for that application to happen. Peer services is um, has to do with node uh, consensus. Soft fork has to do with the height in the Coinbase. 35 peer service peer services just has to do with uh, customer service, uh, mean pool messaging, and connection bloom filters. So this is just a little little minute changes of, of talking across the network, if you will. And it goes on throughout. Um, so the key ones like BIP one BIP 100 is not on here, but BIP 101, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, and 9 all deal with um, consensus hard work. So one-on-one, -on -one, when we talked about it for uh, Bitcoin Classic and XT, it's increasing the max block size. Then you have Jeff Garcic, who tried to clean up his BIP100, um, changing it from 8 megabytes and doing it to block size of 2 megabytes, changing what Mike Kern has been doing. Um, block size following technology growth. This is Peter Wills. Um, version where it's like a percentage of uh, the block size will go up each year. Uh, 105 is consensus based block size retargeting algorithm. This is BTC Stark one. This is, these are all hard forks. Dynamic control, Bitcoin block size max cap, dynamic limit on the block size, uh, 2 million byte size limit with a SIGPOP and SIGTASH hash uh, are our ha all hard hard forks. And then we can get down to where we're getting into segregated witness, which is a soft fork. BIP 141 is a soft fork. Uh, it's a consensus layer soft fork. Uh, BIP 148, I guess when they put this up, this wasn't up here. Let me go to the normal BIP. I think that is a hard fork. So let me find BIP 148. Yeah, BIP 148 is a consensus soft fork with a second data witness, second deployment. Um, the hard fork would be the um, and uh, consensus uh, soft fork 149 as well. Those are by Shaolin Fry. I believe these, these ones are, oh, I don't want to get it wrong, but one of these segments you have to do is add in on uh, the two megabyte increase of the block size, uh, and that is a hard fork. So that's what BIP123 did was to just clarify to understanding uh, what is being changed within the protocol. So the consensus rules. The consensus rules are Bitcoin's most important rules. They establish among many other things the amount of Bitcoins included in the block reward, the mining difficulty, the type of proof of work required, and indeed the block size limit. These rules are so important because they determine which blocks are deemed valid by the full node. And if all full nodes apply the same consensus rules, it ensures that they, they all maintain an identical copy of the blockchain. If different nodes apply different consensus rules, however, they risk accepting blocks that other nodes reject. Such discrepancies can lead to different nodes maintaining a completely incompatible version of the blockchain and effectively splitting the Bitcoin network. Bitcoin consensus rules can be changed in two ways. A change that adds extra rules to the protocol, uh, making previously valid blocks invalid, is called a soft fork. Soft fork requires the majority of the hashing power to support the change. The blocks that are produced under the new rules be valid under the old rules as well, so nodes that didn't upgrade can still follow the longest chain. However, non-upgraded miners might produce blocks that are invalid under the new rules, wasting hash power. And non-upgraded full nodes would no longer be able to verify whether blocks adhere to the new rules, requiring them to wait additional confirmations to achieve the same level of security. For these other reasons, the big core core development team has said that it typically required a super majority of 95% of hash power to agree on a soft fork. So this is a very high threshold of this rule. A consensus rule change that removes rules from the protocol, making previous invalid blocks valid, is called a hard fork. A hard fork requires all full, no full nodes of the network to adopt. Uh, any node that doesn't implement the change might not follow the long chain at all and is considered that chain invalid and stay on the old chain instead. This could split the Bitcoin network as described above. This is what happened with um, Ethereum. That's why you have Ethereum and then ETC Classic, Ethereum Classic. How long such a split could, would preserve is not really a technical question, but rather a debate on politics, sociology, economics, and very more. Soft changes to the consensus rule without consensus could, in a worst case scenario, cause a minority of miners to waste hashing power and slightly degrade the security of full nodes. 
Hard fork changes to the consensus rule without consensus, creating a worst case scenario split the Bitcoin network. So, both of these scenarios, both of them have the potential of creating a split. One of them has the, the probability of it um, happening at a higher degree, which is really the hard fork scenario. Peer to peer layer. The peer to peer layer of the Bitcoin network covers how full nodes share data and what data they share. This includes protocols to send and receive transactions and blocks, as well as special data packages such as, uh, which hasn't been activated, segregated witness, or the integral bloom lookup cable. Most importantly, the peer-to-peer -peer layer must ensure that new blocks find their way through the entire network, as well as data packages required to verify blocks. If a relay policy fails, it would result in a network split where different nodes hold different versions of blockchain, leading to the blocks find their way through the entire network again. But as opposed to the consensus rule, it's not necessarily a huge problem if not every single node applies the exact same relay policy. Since most nodes forward blocks to at least eight peers, this amplifier should ensure that all nodes receive all blocks, even if some of them don't forward properly. Nodes have been more leeway when it comes to relaying transactions. Most nodes on the network today use a first name policy. If they receive two or more conflicting transactions, they reject the letter. For a growing number of nodes, apply a variation of replace by fees policy, meaning they pick the transaction when includes their highest fees, regardless of whether they came first. In addition, some nodes reject certain types of transactions altogether or don't relay transactions at all. Um, that's where you get nodes that might reject something that might have came through, uh, you know, the dark market or something like that. That said, miners ultimately decide which transactions they include in blocks and why. It's only when the transaction relay policies vary widely or are sufficient restricted. They might become unpredictable which transactions are confirmed by the, for these reasons alone. Uh, changes to the peer-to-peer -peer layer without consensus would, could, in a worst-case scenario, split the network. The risk exists that blocks can't find their way throughout the whole network. The split will, however, automatically resolve once the network is reconnected. So if you do have a split and it happens, as soon as the shortest chain, like everyone switches off from the shortest chain to back to the longest chain, then everything is copacetic. Everything comes back together, if you will. If changes concerning transactions only, they could, in worst case scenario, prevent certain transactions from confirming. It can also decrease the re reliability of unconfirmed transactions, but it cannot split the network. So if something were delayed or there was an issue or something like that, it, it just means you get kicked off the network or go back to, from from where you were to the end of the mean pool and go through the process again, if you will. Application program interfaces and remote procedure calls. The application program interface API and remote procedure call layers are communication layers on top of the peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Many Bitcoin software applications such as mobile wallets and block explorers communicate with the blockchain through these layers by connecting to an API or a software library. If one of these layers fails, all connected software applications will be unable to, rel to reliably communicate with the Bitcoin network. Mobile wallets won't know if they receive Bitcoin, and blockchain explorers can't tell whether a new block was found. However, all other Bitcoin users wouldn't notice a thing. The network itself will still be fine. So simply because your, your mobile wallet can connect, it's not going to break the network. Uh, same thing with these block explorers. They, they're not going to... They don't... Um, they don't affect the network. It's just a validation and push-pull receiving of information. They're not actually creating information or validating it. Application. Last, the application layer refers to how the Bitcoin software application creates and uses certain types of data that doesn't really touch the network directly, but it's useful to synchronize across applications. This includes, for example, address format, uh, private key generation, so your HD wallets, or wallet backup. If one wallet generates an address and another wallet doesn't appear to valid, transactions between them will be impossible. So if you have a wallet that has those, like those um, vanity addresses, um, you might have a wallet that doesn't consider it to be valid. Or if one wallet uses a method to create a backup address with seed and another wallet uses another, users can't recover the private keys with each wallet. The same goes for wallet backup. Uh, changes to the application layer without consensus could, in a worst case scenario, prevent some users from mutually transacting and cause other inconvenience. Such changes can't split the network, and th thanks goes out to uh, Labrazo for technical guidance. Simply because um, the fees or the wallet that software application can't communicate, 
it, it doesn't, it's not going to break the network because, again, they're not the ones responsible for validating the information or creating the information. They're, they're receiving and sending. BIP 9 and BIP 34 are the ones that kind of govern the um, software fork, if you will. And this can be the abstracts. So BIP 9 is the documentation specifies the proposed change to semantics of the version field in Bitcoin blocks, allowing multiple backward compatible changes, further called soft work, to be deployed in parallel. It relies in, in interpreting the version field a bit vector with each bit can be used to track an independent change. These are tallied each retargeted period. Once the consensus change succeeds or times out, there's a follow or pause at which the bit can be reused for later changes. So if a BIP doesn't um, reach consensus, uh, it times out, if you will, but you can later put it back into the network and try to reach a consensus uh, threshold. Um, motivation. BIP 34 introduces me mechanics for doing soft fork changes without a predefined flag time state or flag block height. Instead, rely on the measuring minor support indicated by a higher version number in the block height. As I realize I'm comparing version numbers in the third power, it only supports one single change being rolled out at once, requiring coordination between proposals and doesn't allow for permanent rejection. As long as one soft fork is not fully rolled out, no further one can be scheduled. So basically, if some a soft fork was propagated out on the network, and then because it doesn't have an end date, then you can't do another type of change if there was like a significant crack or an error. And this changes that. In addition, BIT34 made an integer comparison and consensus roll after its 95% threshold was reached, uh, removing the value from the set and the value numbers. This indicates another downside of this approach. Every upgrade permanently restricts the set of allowed field, of field values. This approach was further really reused in BIT66 and BIT65, which further removes um, the version and the valid op uh, option. And so basically, BIP9 kind of clarified and changed and changed that with the came for BIP34. So basically what it does is um, each soft fork deployment is specified by following a per-chain parameter. So one, the name of specified change, a very diff brief description of the soft fork, uh, re responsible for it to use as identifier for the deployment, described in a single bit. Two, the bit determines which bit in the, in the block size, so which block is going to single it. Uh, the soft fork lock-in and activation. So the start time specifies a minimum medium time pass of a block in which the bit gains its meaning. And timeout specifies a time in which deployment is considered failed. If the medium time passes a block, a timeout in the soft fork has not yet locked in, including the bit's block state, deployment is considered failed, and all descendants of the block. So you, you start the clock, and if you don't reach your, your time, then you're done and you kind of basically have to restart the clock again if you want to try to try to get this to go through. So you have to go all the way back to the beginning and set a new time frame and a new parameter, if you will, to get your bit, um, the soft work going. So that's pretty much it. This is why consensus is talked about, because you're changing the protocols. You have to go through a certain type of process, whether it be soft work or hard work. You have to get both miners and nodes on board. Um, this is why it's been a very contentious issue because it requires both hashing power and the nodes to validate. And if that doesn't happen, then you're not going to get um, your proposal through. And these type of protocols, so the changes to the Bitcoin protocol, um, to reach that consensus, to reach that threshold, 95%, to get that hashing power to go through. Um, it's set so high that you don't, A, break the network, B, um, change it such that it is no longer considered um, a valid system or um, something that people want to participate. You have to be very careful and considerate and precise with the type of changes you're trying to seek and make. So there's that safeguard. And the other is that there, there are rules set in place that are planned out that everyone kind of agrees on from the beginning that this is the consensus. And then if you're adding a new rule, then you have to get everyone to agree upon to that new rule, and that becomes the new consensus, and that becomes the new rule that everyone plays along with. It's kind of like, you know what, you don't want Calvin Ball, basically, where you just kind of make things up willy-nilly as you 
go about your day or whatever it is you're doing. You, you kind of want some set parameters. And because of proof of work, you're, you're not getting malicious actors or um, people forcing the issue um, necessarily. Now, there is some centralization within this decentralized network when it comes to mining. And we've discussed it on and off throughout this series about how much sway other miners have. And this has been a very big contention and why certain proposals haven't gone through. But that's pretty much what the consensus is. This is what people are talking about. These are the protocols. These are the rules. This is the methodology. Um, this is why we have it. Um, the proof of work. Um, the basic, basic layer and foundation of Bitcoin and a majority of cryptocurrencies out there. So thank you for listening. Um, next episode, we're going to talk about lowering the block size or keeping the status quo, if you will. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosia Shine Space Odyssey Network production.